Good evening. Um, my name is Kate Orff, and I'm the director of the urban design program here at GSAP, and um, also a former student of Walters. <laughs> so I could not be more honored and pleased to have the opportunity to introduce our colleague and friend, Walter Hood, and to really warmly welcome him to Columbia. Walters cut a path through the world of the arts, architecture, landscape, and education that is truly his own and has invented a sort of entirely new genre, something like creative civic design through his practice. His projects defy the knee-jerk attempt to categorize them as typologies, urban design, landscape, planning, large-scale solar market, underpass park, wildlife terrace. Even just the attempt to name his projects hints at their underlying complexity and newness. It also points to his resistance to received ideas in urban form and typology and at his open-ended and context-driven design methods. Walter is the David K. Wu Chair in Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley, and he's also the founder of Hood Design based in Oakland. He received the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Landscape and was also a design fellow at the Smithsonian. His work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale, among many other venues. I would say, you know, I guess I'm especially thrilled uh, to expose our students of urban design and planning to Walter's work and perspective. The Columbia Urban Design Program originated in 1935, and at that point was clustered together with planning. It was, in a sense, sort of refounded in the 1964-1965 school year as a separate master's program with uh, then Professor per Percival Goodman as a key pedagogic force. The late Professor Go Goodman, who was very influential on, on GSAP as a whole, um, was a persistent critic of urban renewal program as it existed at that time, in that uh, a program that's largely displaced people and destroyed historic fabric. Of course, we'd all, we've all advanced our shared thinking quite a bit in this regard, but I truly can't imagine anyone working today who has so completely reframed the conversation about the nature of renewal, so to speak, and the radically different improvisational, temporal, and cooperative ways of working that might engender a completely different and better concept of renewal than Walter's always creative, always rooted, and always inspiring works. So thanks very much, Walter. Welcome. Thanks, Kate. I have to say I was Kate's professor, but I was actually 19 when I was teaching. So that <laughs> dates me really well. Um, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here at Columbia. And uh, I was just telling Lila earlier, I've been coming to New York so many years and I've just never come to Columbia, right? I mean, and it's like, well, how, how did that happen? And I think a lot of it has to do with geography <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with just where my interests are when I come to the island, it's somewhere else. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here. If students are here from the review that I was at upstairs, I really enjoyed sitting around the last four hours and seeing what you guys are working on. Really massive, hard problems that you're trying to deal with. Um, but one thing, one thing I'd like to posit if they're here tonight is don't forget about the river. Right? I mean, you're looking at these little towns along the Hudson, and the Hudson is an amazing river, which means landscape really does matter. If you zoom out, it might help you zooming back in. Tonight, I'd like to talk really about landscape and why it matters. And for me, over the last 20, how does this work, Kate? 25 years. Try this for now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Keyboard. For the last 25 years, I've tried to sort of navigate the terrain of design, particularly out of urban design, architecture, and landscape, and art. And as part of my MFA at the Art Institute, I made this diagram to help myself figure out, well, how do I actually make decisions, and can I relay that to you know, my students and as well as my clients? And the one point I just want to point out is this little area here called points of, or periods of bifurcation or determination. And this is in a design process where I would say to the students, this is where the courage happens in any project. You know, that we know we have to begin on one end and end on the other. But there are going to be these moments where doubt comes in, chance, travel, music, 
all of these more subjective things. And it's up to you to own those things. If you don't, somebody else will. But that's you in the work. That's how you bring yourself forward within the work. And over the last 20 years or so, we've been able to make work that primarily deal with the everyday and mundane acts of life, how we commemorate ourselves in space, and lastly, community lifeways. And the lifeways, to me, have more to do with place. Most people live their life in landscape, and you can't forget it. Landscape shapes you, and it shapes how you view the world. Landscapes are small, some of them are large. I'm from North Carolina. I'm from a landscape that's very enclosed, very green. I now live in a landscape that's very open. Open in a lot of ways. In the closed way of North Carolina, the values, the moors are very closed. In the open landscape of California, they're very open. And for me, going back and forth, it allows you to make work that says something about the places, but also says something about the people. And this is what I really enjoy about design. Sometimes I'm introduced as Walter cares for people. And it's like, we should all care for people. You know, when you do work, you're doing work for people. And how we engage people in the work becomes really, really important. And the work to me changes in how we see ourselves and how we see other people. And I'm showing this work without explaining it because a lot of the times, most of the times, I want the work to speak for itself. And the work can take on many different shapes, varied sizes, and engage many different people. The work that we're performing now, a lot of it has to do with how do we plant these seeds and let things go in the landscape. And when you let things go, things begin to emerge. There are nascent and latent landscapes around us. You guys live in, on an island here. You know, you only know you live on an island in times of turmoil or catastrophe. I remember after 9-11, a friend called me and said, I can't leave the island. It's the first time I ever heard someone say that, right? Or after the hurricane. So, but when you sort of think about it, you then might be able to sort of say something different about your place. This is a college campus that actually has a wildlife federation that came and actually certified a habitat on its campus. And that all came through someone asking a question like, I have 5,000 PV panels, what am I gonna do with them? Right, and out of that emerged wildlife habitat, but it also emerged a different way that people kind of see themselves in a landscape. Landscapes really matter because if we talk about them, we can then talk about how we make them. Here we destroyed all the sidewalks on campus and used the paving for actual paving and then actually provided places for school kids to come but gave the campus a new image. And when we think differently, other people graft onto those ideas and they're allowed to have the conversation. In my studio, we by no means try to say, Walter Hood's work is this, and this is what we do. We try to make the project, let it go, and hopefully over time, people graft onto those projects. Our firm is nine people, nine to 10 people. We do more speculative work, as I just showed, but we also make large projects. This is the new de Young Museum. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. Over 10 million people have come through this landscape. This is a Herzog and Demeron building and a Walter Hood landscape. And I'm always blown away when people go, I understand your work. You do circles, or you do these crazy forms. And somehow in our profession, the epistemology or the kind of the language is something that people sort of try to tie to an individual. And I am happy to say after 10 years, this landscape really belongs to Golden Gate Park and the people who live there doesn't belong to me. And it's been nurtured over time. It's become local gardens for communities. It's become major plazas for the city. It's become an ecological terrarium for that local flora. And it's become places now where kids can come back and actually learn about a fiction, a fiction that took about 100 years to sort of create that's still being created. At the edge of the, the city, the sand dunes were turned over at the end of the 19th century into this large park, just like Central Park. Unlike New York, development didn't follow it, but people followed it. And you can still kind of experience that as you go and look back towards the city. Landscapes are ever changing, but they also provide this sort of place for people to begin to engage. We never thought that weddings would be a big venue in this garden. But it turned out the way the pathways led and the building made a backdrop, this was perfect for weddings. It's also a place where history, you can kind of see where the old museum set and the new museum starts out. Landscapes are really, really 
important for us to understand as we move around them. If you've ever been to Jackson, Wyoming, you think, why would people live there? I mean, it's really cold. There's like three types of trees. There's like bison. There's like elk. Uh, and it's a really, really tough landscape. But then you go there, and no one sees the landscape. And again, it's a very urban condition. This is on your way between the airport and the downtown, and this is a paved parking lot that holds 320 cars. And we were asked to come in and design a, a trail for sculpture. And for us, you know, we're not interested in the moose or the other weird things that find themselves at this museum, but I was really blown away by, look at that moraine out there. And if you understand Jackson Hole, the glacier came through and actually created this amazing landscape but people don't see it. And so over time, five years, we work with the director and this is what you have now. There are no more cars and this was the first image that was sent back to us. And the reclamation of that landscape, and I say reclamation of this kind of urban idea of what landscape should be, really allowed this landscape to transform and for people then to actually live in the landscape. And I get postcards and calls sometimes and people just taking pictures and they can't believe that they're walking. You know, and again, when you're in a car so much and all of a sudden you get out, you see things differently. And it's changed the scale of everything. To remove the car changes your perception because you don't see things 10 by 20 anymore. You see things by what's out there in the landscape. And there's a road actually at the top of that terrace. There's a road down below and we just push the bench out to make it go away. The island of New York, as you guys know, is a big geological rock, and we've had the opportunity to work here on a couple of occasions. The Cooper Hewitt Museum asked us to sort of design a garden here, and one of my friends, Margie Ruddick, actually gave a lecture two weeks ago on this garden, and I heard it sort of through simulcast, and I was really intrigued by the way she talked about it being a gem in the city and it doesn't want to be a kind of a destination, but it graphs off of Central Park in the larger kind of wilderness. I hadn't showed her any of our sort of work beforehand, but she got it right. I mean, we saw the Shimmerhorn plan and we said, hmm, it wasn't fully implemented, but it had this beautiful thing called a rockery. So I researched what a rockery was since I didn't know, just a pile of rocks with plants. Um, and we tried to give it form again. But this was my first sketch, and the sketch actually shows I was turned on by the reservoir being there and the garden being here. And if you stand at the reservoir in the winter, you can see the garden. If you're in the garden, you can see the reservoir. So this notion of bringing these two things together, compressing them, is basically what we did for the garden. And also bringing that history, that story of Shimmerhorn all the way forward. Again, landscapes when you're not in them and you look out, if you're on the rooftop looking down, you see something completely different in this two-dimensional extent. But again, if you walk around in that three dimension, you actually begin to see things like that there is a, a cherry grove, that there is these herbaceous native plantings, that there's a roto mile, and they actually tell you what kind of plants they are. And it was one day I just happened to be out having lunch, walking, and I noticed people going by writing down the plants. And so we decided, oh, that's pretty easy. Let's bring them all into the garden. And so we brought everything from across the street into the garden to create this smaller landscape. And then in the fall, it opened up. And this summer, in a robust set of programming, they, they've enjoyed the garden. As we were digging, of course, you dig anywhere. That's why you hear jackhammers in New York. There's just rock everywhere. And we actually specced out that we would buy new rock. And of course, working with the federal government, that's really hard um, to almost buy anything. Uh, but we actually luckily found the rock on site uh, and began to sort of reuse that. But the garden now has another life, and hopefully the next 100 years, the citizens of Manhattan will actually utilize this. Caroline, the director, wants this to be open seven days a week to people coming in. They really programmed it this summer to sort of give it new life and vitality. If you have a chance, go down, have a cup of coffee, and sit in one of these weird little seats and spin around. Um, or just go and watch this time of year how the park actually becomes part of your playground. Moving back out to the West Coast, a project really different, the Broad Museum by Dillard Scrofidio and Renfro, 
takes a completely different approach than the sort of the, the diamond or gem in the city. Here, there was no landscape. If you've been to LA, Bunker Hill, there's a tunnel here at Upper Grand. That's where all the movies are filmed. It's the only tunnel in downtown. The landscape is pretty much a fiction. What we designed on top of that, connecting to Mocha, is basically an upside down freeway ramp. And we put on that freeway ramp a lot of old trees. And then when it opened, people were able to go into a single grove and a piece of lawn. It's very different than anything else in LA. There's no red chairs, there's no fountain going crazy. It's just a very quiet space. And people are drawn to the simplicity for a lot of reasons. One, the building is pretty hyper and the landscape feels like it's just always been there. It's calm, it doesn't try to say too much, it says very little. But if, when you stand next to these olive trees, you have a feeling, though, that they've been there all along and that they'll always be there for you if you walk along the street. There are moments where people feel compelled within the small grove of trees along a major busy road and a gigantic veil of a building. When we were finishing this project, California went into drought. Um, and you can't believe this small little piece of lawn got so much talk about you're using too much water. And thank God our infrastructure, since we're on top of a freeway, we were basically able to hold water underneath. And we probably have one of the finest um, reusable water systems in the state under this lawn. Now, I, I ran through the first part of this pretty fast because I wanted the second half of this to really deal with the subject, Black Landscapes Matter. And again, I was struck by the studio when I was there. When we're looking at urban landscapes, when we're looking at places where the demographic suggests that their brown people have been there for a while, but they've been left behind, how do we, how do we not solve the questions, but how do we talk about it? And the reason why I wanted to talk about landscapes and then black landscapes matter, it's not always about fixing things, right? It's not always about finding the answer and solving a certain problem. Sometimes it's just about, well, maybe I should understand the story or maybe I should find the palimpsest so other people. And Brian Stevenson in his book, he talks about this notion that these stories of people's lives, whether you're immigrant, whether you're a slave, we should have them all around us, right? When I walk down the street, I should be reminded of the Dutch, of the blacks who lived here in this place, maybe through the architecture, through the landscape, but we need to be reminded because when we're not reminded, we forget that they ever existed. So when we come into contact with these questions, we immediately try to fix things and solve problems. And a lot of the times the problems are not to be solved. At the University of Virginia, as they were building the South Campus or the South Lawn, they found a, a small house and they found like I think 28 bodies interned in this small place. And we were working on the building and landscape and they asked my studio if we would do a commemorative piece to Kitty Foster who was the first black freed woman here. And I thought really long and hard about this and one of the things that came to my mind was the kind of the myths of the South, and particularly Robert Ferris Thompson's Flash of the Spirit, where he talked about if you go to African American cemeteries or cemeteries in the lowlands of Louisiana, you find people would place tin on the, on the burial and they'd wait for the light to hit, and when the light hit the tin on the poinsettias or the plants, it would give a flash, right? And that flash would send this person to heaven. Right? And I also remember my grandmother talking about these kinds of stories in the South. And so what we did was design a shadow catcher. And the shadow catcher is very simple. It casts a shadow on the ground. And then when you look down, you see the shadow. And then when you look up, you see the flash. And it's a very simple project. But it's a project that forces you in body and mind to think about Kitty Foster, not as a slave, not as a free black, but as someone right, who deserves this portal. And I was there about a month ago and there was this couple who were walking through and they were starting their visit of the campus from the lower part up. 
And they said, wow, this University of Virginia, they really know how to deal with their history. And I went, wow, I had never heard that on the campus, talking about slavery and talking about free blacks. And this idea that you can posit these ideas without telling the full story, that we can leave things open, to me, brings along sort of the culture and life of people past in a way that's dignified and also in a way that said they exist along with the other ghosts of the past in North America. For the cemetery, we basically just created this sculpture because we didn't know who the people were, but we wanted to create a ground that you stayed back from. And when you're having your coffee up at Starbucks, what's really beautiful, you can look out and you can see the Kitty Foster landscape. And I think that's one of the powerful things about this is its place. There's no fence around it. Students freely walk through and they're constantly reminded of someone else. And now they have another project on campus to talk about the enslaved workers. So this was the first and hopefully not the last project of its type. <coughs> we were working in Oakland, California, along a public street, and a couple of brothers kept coming into the meeting in dashikis, and they kept saying, I want five M's, I want five M's. And I was like, what is he talking about? It's like, why can't we have Martin, Malcolm, in our landscape, and they wanted this sculpture. And the previous designers, every time they came in, pretty much said, well, we'll figure it out, we'll figure something out. If you go to 7th Street today, there are five black heroes over the road. This thing is eight feet tall by 50 feet wide. And every day at sunset, the sun sets behind them. Maya Angelou is in the middle, and a local barkeep is right next to her. And this was done in 2008, I guess, because Barack is in there. And then we have Martin and Malcolm on the two sides. And this project for me, again, is one of these things that reminded me of many of the houses and that people talked about that they had Kennedy on the wall, they had Martin Luther King on the wall. And this notion that our heroes live with us, right? They live with us daily. Again, they're not canonized in some particular way. They're just there in the everyday and mundane. And again, if you could imagine through the scale of these projects, that there were more of these, our cities would be more interesting. We just recently opened the Bayview Opera House in San Francisco. This was an 1860s storefront, uh, tilt up building that was given to the community by the city of San Francisco. Over the years, it fell upon disrepair. It sits on like a slope about 30 feet in half of a block. It needed ADA repair. For years, the city was like, well, we don't know what to do. We were asked to come in, and we provided a floating walkway through this landscape that allowed people to come back, and they don't have to pay admission to get into the opera house. They basically get to use the landscape 24-7. We just had the opening, and people talked about how the landscape now reflects their idea of what the arts can be in their community. There's a full stage, full sound system that they can use any time that they want to, where before they had to wait for a certain person to come, unlock the gate, and then tell them how to use the landscape. And for the city of San Francisco to open something so freely, I give them major props. Again, and now the children can actually use the stage in different ways. There's an audience. We tore down the brick wall. You can now see the retail across the street. Hopefully this will become the new center, the new center for the arts. For the last 30 years, there have been drama and music practice here. When it went into disrepair, they put in community gardens, chickens and things like that because people wanted to fix the problem. And I went to one meeting and someone said, well, the reason why we have hay bales and small um, community kitchen gardens here is because we want the kids to know where their food came from. And here we are in this beautiful opera house and we're talking about food. Right? where most people in the community remembered that that's where they learned drama, that's where they learned dance, that's where they learned their oration skills. And so bringing that back full circle allows those voices to be heard, but it also gives them a different image and a different way to come back into the building. And one of the neighbors sent me this picture. He was up above shooting down, and he watched for three years as this was being remade. And he couldn't believe that the city was spending this kind of money in their neighborhood. And this building, we spent $1.7 million. And I told him on the opening day, I've never seen that kind of money spent in a community space, which means we spent about $75, $80 a square foot, which is pretty expensive. And so when you think about that kind of equity, Right? You want to make sure you're going to get something out of it. <coughs> a 
for years I'd always seen this term freedmen, freed women. A friend of mine, Everett Fly, uh, was responsible for finding in the archives the early freedmen's villages. And if you don't know what they are doing the Emancipation Proclamation, a freedmen's bureau was set up to deal with the contraband, which were the free slaves. The first one was done at Arlington Cemetery in Washington, D.C. on the Lee Plantation. So right across the, the river, you can actually see the plantation up on the hill. They had the first freedmen's village. We were asked to come to this place called Nauck, N-A-U-C-K, and design a commemorative piece for this village, which they said looked like that, but really didn't. It probably might look more like that. So this notion of freed men, freed women kind of stayed with me for a long time. It's like, well, why didn't they call it Freedom Town or something like that? But this notion of freed has a connotation behind it, a connotation that suggests that there was an emancipator, right? that someone let someone go. right? And I do believe we're still dealing with, and I say we, people of color, African Americans, are dealing with this it's almost psychosis today. And I would also say whites, too. This notion that the permission that, that we need to know that we can do certain things. Where some people came to the country and they had freedom. They saw the standing beauty and they knew from day one that they had rights. And here, just within the two-dimensional representation of the freedmen, we know we didn't. And I was reminded of Denise Scott Brown's uh, quote, why the methods of commercial persuasion, skyline of signs, the basic the semiotics of space. And so I took this challenge on to say, we don't want any more of these gray and black headstones. They look just like funerary stones, and they're used everywhere. And if you see one, you've seen them all. They don't really move you in any way. And when you read them, you go, OK, the first experience of life out of bondage, it doesn't really say anything. And they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. And so I told the community and the um, Arts Council that we really wanted to change this perception. I said, give it a try. And so this is how currently, they remember this community today. It's through this barbed wire. African American men sit out here, drink, smoke, talk, and there's this historic timeline there. And again, no power to talk as shape a community. The landscape is much larger. So the first day we went out, I said, can we get a van and can we drive around? And one of the older elder statesmen said, Walter, you should see Green Valley. I said, what's Green Valley? And what he was talking about was the landscape of this, land, of this neighborhood. And they called it Green Valley. Because if you go down to Arlington Cemetery and look back up, it's this beautiful valley back to the river. And so we started the landscape thinking that they wanted a town square, but we included more and more of the landscape. And as we began to talk about what this landscape should be, a place, a crossroads, a place where you could go at night, a place where there could be a market on the weekends and change the daily lives and patterns of the inhabitants, but it could also be a place where there would be a beacon. And this beacon would be the statue that's entitled Freed. It says F-R-E-E-D. And it sits at the top, it's to the left here, of a hill and as well as a small public space. And it suggests that there is, how can I say, a monumentality to the landscape. It's about 15 feet from one end to the other. And this statue is going to be made of gold. Because we love bling. I love bling, right? I mean, this notion that you see it from a distance, and you come up to it, and it's this beautiful piece of gold, just like you see adorned on the top of capitals, big soldiers on horses, gilded. And the way we're going to gild them is we have all of the first names of all the freed individuals who were in this community, and each one will have a badge. After the emancipation, most African Americans from Charleston north to Virginia had to wear a badge, and you had to wear this badge to say you were free, you had a number, and what you did. So if you were a potter, a banker, or whatever, you would have that. We're starting to make these badges out of eighth inch to quarter inch steel, and we'll actually stamp each one and actually make the statue based on that. All of the local churches will take different sides of the F, and all of the residences will have the horizontal piece, and will probably run out by the time we get to the top of the R, and everything else will just be gilded above. But this idea, when we presented it to the community, the public art fund said, you can't present this, they're gonna hate it. I presented it to the community, and one by one, the residents pretty much got up and talked about what this would mean to them. And even some of the um, 
non-black residents got up and said, you know, everyone needs to understand what freed means or being freed. And then she went into like, like I'm freed from my marriage. But she went on to talk about just this notion though that there could be a conversation in the community about this and not about freedom and not about slavery but just this act in itself. And at night, hopefully this beacon will be seen throughout the community, people to come there and actually feel dignified and feel like they have a place in this landscape and they have something to say that's been heard. Next month, we'll erect this project. It's called Witness Walls. It's commemorating civil rights in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm, again, I'm from North Carolina. I didn't know Nashville, Tennessee had a civil rights movement. I, I understood, I know Nashville from music. Uh, it's called Music City. Um, after winning the competition, we were privy to find out that it had a civil rights movement and it worked really fast. Diane Nash and others basically did one of the first sit-ins there and the mayor saw how it was gonna change the economy of the downtown and they immediately said, okay, we integrate. There were marches, there were bus uh, and sit-ins um, and they were able to do that. We were privy to some of the images from the Courier Post, the uh, local newspaper. The newspaper sent out photographers doing the marches to photograph people doing you know, civil unrest but they never published the images. And so now all of these images are in an archive where you can go and see them. And as I was perusing the images, some of the things that came out were women carrying their kids to school, beautifully, beautifully dressed and proud, while gangs of people are taunting them. But the look on their faces just blew my mind and we thought, well, let's do a piece that talks about marching and sitting, almost like you would see a freeze. Um, and let, let's do it out of a material that's of the 20th century concrete. And let's try to sort of create this moment where people can come and actually see a different view of what the civil rights movement might have been about. The images that you see, again, are always kind of set in this context of the urban landscape, but they also are set in this desolate landscape. And so we've, we're building five walls that you walk through. Two are concave, a couple are convex, and a couple are straight. On the curved ones, people are walking, and on the straight ones, people are sitting. We were able to mine the archives. The community felt strong that none of the images should be a recognizable person. Like, it shouldn't be Diane Nash, it shouldn't be Martin Luther King. They should be ordinary people that we wanted people to come and touch, talk, and listen. There will be music piped in. We'll be playing music from the civil rights movement, so it won't be civil rights song. It'll be what the radio was playing during that time. And uh, we were working with one of the DJs there, and he talks about you know, Aretha Franklin, you know, some of the R&B songs that you would hear on the radio during that time. Again, it's a very simple project um, where the tactility how you move through the space and who you see becomes very important. There's a small little rim of water sitting next to it, almost like a baptismal. And as you move through, hopefully you hear the sounds of water, the sounds of music, and the sounds of people moving and touching. To make the images, again, we took a lot of the pieces from the archives, blew them up, and repositioned them using Piero della Francesca's religious paintings. And so some of the women you know, are in these poses along with other faces menacing uh, from that time. And this is one of the panels. The panels are done with CNC, uh, vertical, um, so that as the light hits the photo etch, on one side it's photo real, the light changes during the day. And on the other, we were able to actually create block prints. These walls are going to be 12 feet by 12. And the aggregate, we're working with a concrete company that's able to get a resolution almost down to an eighth of an inch. So you can actually see the black aggregate. And having these two things work back to back hopefully give you a different kind of sensation but creates a different place and a different conversation for people to have. This has been a very arduous task doing this project because some people want things that are really representational 
with techs and all of these. And we've really had a good civil rights group, uh, some of them you know, on in their age, but this one woman, she's gotta be at least 75, she says, are you the artist? She goes, you do what you wanna do, sir. And by having that kind of empowerment, she sees that again, hopefully this won't be the only one. Imagine if they, we have 20 of these in Nashville, they'll all say something different. This last project I want to share with you is in progress. It's the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. I was just talking with someone. They got hit really hard uh, with the hurricane. But this building sits right on the edge of the wharf in Charleston. Harry Cobb of Pay Cobb is doing the building. The building's about a football field long, and it sits 13 feet off the ground, almost levitating at the edge of Charleston. We started working on the project a few years ago, and for us, these tactics of landscape, microclimate, geology, hydrology were very, very powerful for a, a beginning for us to have a conversation about a site which many believe 40% of the African diaspora began there in North America. We, we did the archaeology. They were able to find the old warehouse where they housed the slaves as they moved back and forth from Sullivan's Island. But the low country, if you've never been there, is steeped in a kind of a history and a fiction. Middleton's uh, plantation is over to the right. We studied in the landscape architecture school. And none of my professors ever talked about slavery. Never talked that slaves actually built this landscape with sweet grass baskets. Right? This beautiful, formal landscape was actually made with hands. If you walk along the pathways, the pathways the edges curved down. You can sort of see the handwork in everything from the bricks to the planting to the patterning on walls. But we also know that there was a voyage, right, that's separated people from along the Atlantic and that brought them here. Jonathan Green reminds me, he's a local artist, reminds me that South Carolina, you know, this was the first billion billion dollar sort of industry or economy and that this was the place that had the first theater, the first library, the first movie that had everything first on the back of Carolina gold. And Carolina gold is a rice, right? And that rice, as soon as the slaves arrived, it changed the industry tenfold. And people made lots of money, but most people don't know about this. The kind of, I took this image from Sullivan's Island. There's a small exhibit about the size of this stage, and everything else is to military. But they have one little room in the back where they have the shackles. And I was taken by the Brooks map, uh, and this was the first map that was, print that was done, that was distributed worldwide at the time that showed how slaves were packed on the ships. And this image kind of stayed with me because I had never seen one this abstract. And so as we moved through the project, we, we had groups of people go around from place to place. And this one moment kind of blew my mind, uh, just had this cathartic sort of moment. We were on Sullivan's Island, and if you know Toni Morrison, the, the writer, Pulitzer Prize writer, she's doing this chair or bench project where she's placing benches around the U.S. and all of these sites because her prose is, there's no place for me to go and sit and think about my ancestors, right? Which is really profound. And what she means by that, there's no Ellis Island, there's no Plymouth Rock. There's no place for most African Americans to go and really say, this is where I'm from, right? And so her making this moment, now there's like 15 of us gathered around a little bench taking pictures. And here we are on Sullivan's Island, right? This landscape in Charleston. And, and I use that to talk to the members of the committee in how we thought to commemorate and make a landscape in this place. I also, for the first time, saw this term, rice field Negroes. And I had never heard that before. But again, if you could work, if you were young, you could work in the rice fields. And those were the early, the young slaves that were sought. And so they were the prized. And that's how they were promoted. So this landscape that we're creating is pretty much a cacophony of space along an edge to the top. There's a small sort of grove of trees. And underneath this building, the columns here, there are two meters wide, the columns. 
13 feet high, made a tabby. There's a central core, and the landscape basically pushes underneath this building, creating different stories and different moments for people to engage. It's a landscape where we're hoping has a kind of a temporal condition, but it also has a profoundness because on this place, Gadsden's Wharf existed, and it was one of the largest wharfs in North America at the time. It was, I want to say, 300 feet long and ran all the way down towards the market of Charleston. The site that we have is open, so this is the only place that you're, you're able to sort of understand that archaeology. But really thinking about the low country landscape and importing these different materials, the brickwork that we're getting local artisans to work on, the sweet grass or grass fields that you see that are so important to the coastline of Charleston and also to the rice crop, and then the microclimate that you need in the sweltering heat of the south. And these things come together to create place, to talk about a time. And over time, the epiphytes in the air take over. Right? So when you go to these low-lying landscapes, you start to see this moss because things are in the air. It's so rich. And we think through all of these elements, right, the ghosts of the past are able to roam freely and engage you. And you see that today when you walk down the market. And the only kind of history that you have to sort of understand this large landscape is the sweet grass basket making. When I first went to Charleston maybe 10 years ago, you could buy a basket for maybe $50. Now they're like 500, right? So they've become really, really important, not because of the economics of supply and demand, it's because all the sweet grass has disappeared. And so now people making the baskets have to go as far as Georgia to get the sweet grass to make it. And so again, if we can understand landscape, as we think about this project, maybe there's a way to bring back some of the crops that will allow this artisan um, to actually unfold. The way we think about archaeology is going to be very simple. The red line running from north to south is basically where Gaston's Wharf, actually the edge of the water, used to be. Everything today outward is bulkhead, so we're up about 15 feet off the ground. The red square is where the warehouse was. So you imagine you came, you landed, and the warehouse was stored still about 500, 300 feet going down the warehouse, and now it's been built over. Simple materials mark those spots. And as you move through other places, materials like wood and tabby, which is local oyster uh, shells, create the other marker. We're able to work, again, with local artisans for the woodworking and for the tabby. They're amazing tabby um, artisans in the low country. And then at night, the most, I think, spectacular part of the project is it's public. There's no fence around it, so you can be walking down, uh, promenading, and find yourself underneath this building at night. And when you find yourself there, you're then able to sort of, again, have an understanding of this place, which is hallowed ground, but it's also a place for the public to come. Mother Emmanuel is about two blocks away. That's where the shooting was in Charleston. And we've tried to connect all of these cultural points together. You can walk to all of them, and you have a completely different understanding of the Charleston low country landscape and the people who lived in it. The landscape in certain places is really hyper because of scale and because of some of the issues of hurricanes. Um, but we've tried to sort of create, again, an experience where you always look out to the Atlantic Ocean. The landscape is open, and you always have that view out to Sullivan's Island, the ebb and flow, the building sitting up, the tabby ground. And when you encounter the wood, you encounter the buoyancy of the wharf. There's one element to the south where we have the warehouse. And of course, where the warehouse is located, it's also a fire lane. It's also all of these other urban design gestures where you can't close it. And this is a moment where we, we knew we had people and an experience because, again, this is real. This is um, underfoot. And so you walk through these double walls of, of stone that reflect yourself along with these ch statues of children. So there will be five children, uh, male and female, kneeling, working into the land. And as you make your way through, you're reflected along with them. And again, these landscapes work during the day and during the evening. And hopefully, when you're there, you don't need to go into the museum. 
per se, but you can have an experience of landscape. And as you leave this landscape, you go into old Charleston or into these really beautiful streets of Charleston. And we're hoping that these two experiences, right, they have a way of speaking to themselves because you'll see the same kind of artistry in the gardens that are made as, as well as in those landscapes. And then for the kind of the big moment, we're recreating the water that's now below us. Because if you've been to Charleston, Charleston is pretty much a wetland, and so you never see the water. So we're creating an infinity pool that's about four, three, about 200 feet wide that you have to cross over in both directions as you move back towards the edge. And what this is is a landscape where that's wet and dry and the brooks map in paving at full scale. There'll be the silhouettes of about an eighth inch uh, reveal of the human bodies stacked head to toe, head to toe. And as you look back across, again, you see the water and you see the reflection. And you might choose to touch, but you might choose to stay away. In a lot of our focus groups, a lot of the people in the community was like, you don't want to step on those bodies. It's like, you're right. And so there will be this reverence, but we also understand that there will be people wanting to participate. It might be young children. But we're hoping that that image stays in your head. It's not an image on a sign. It's an image in full space. And as you move through the fountain, you find yourself in the low country, in this area of sweet grass. As you move further underneath the building, there are these smaller gardens. And most of the gardens, the best way to describe them are we've taken classical colonial gardens and we've Africanized them, right? Everything has this other layer to them. So this is the moss garden where you're basically hanging moss within the gardens that creates these different rooms. And moss is really beautiful. When it's not wet, it turns silver. When it gets a little water, it turns green. So it's constantly changing and swaying in the wind. And then at the other end, we're catching all the water off of the roof. And these are the areas where you can actually grow rice. And there are programs to actually show how the cultivation of rice was actually grown in the low country. And as you're making your way out or back in, these sweet grass baskets that we're making, working with local artisans, are about 48 inches high, and you can actually go inside them. And this is where you're able to leave a note or you're able to just come and sit and think. And then hopefully at night there's ritual that's constantly being enacted. It's constantly being enacted because the stories are plentiful in Charleston. There's not one story, there are multiple stories. There's stories of the Gullah, there are stories of um, Africans that came later, there are stories of whites, there are stories of new immigrants that can be told in this landscape. And so this is the building, this is what most birds will see. Um, this long football field building, which I think is just going to be magnificent because Harry is thinking about the building not as a metaphor, but a building as a place where you can actually come and trace your history in half of it, and half of it will actually hold artifacts. But it's also a building that makes a landscape. When we first got the project, Harry called me and said, Walter, this project is about structure and landscape. You and Guy, you have to create something that is magnificent. And this idea, I don't say it like Harry, um, but this idea that a building making a landscape, it's not around it, but it creates a context, a context for memory, but a context for the everyday. And I really do think when we open in 2019, it'll be a place where there are certain moments where you're, you might be conflicted. And like some of the other projects, what we're trying to do in all of these works is to get all of us to think differently about a group of people who are thought singularly. We have one kind of stereotypical image of our past, where I think our past and our present and our future, it's multidimensional, it's complex, it's mythical, and it's very powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so struck by, I guess, uh, 
the sort of the total originality of thought, frankly. I mean, in the sense of, and I kind of wanted my first question. I have a couple questions, and I would love to open it up to the audience. But I, my first question is is a little bit um, on a personal level, I guess. You showed, you know, you showed the work. I I find it totally fascinating that you know hood design, and you you have had a, a very strong kind of national. Um, presence for, for many, many years. And I feel like you really very consciously have sort of curated your own work in a way that, you know, the, the work that you've shown has, is in, incredibly meaningful. It's a, of a scale that um, kind of enables you also to have this very specific connection with the place and the people that you're working with. And I guess I know, you know, from your personal history that you kind of came through architecture, mm -hmm. and then went, you know, and then and taught and, and, and expanded the field into landscape, and then also began to study sculpture a little bit. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that, because I do feel like that the work is, does defy, oh, I am a landscape architecture professional, and my office does these types of projects, and here's 20 that right. look the same. I mean, it is so radically coming from a different place. And I guess I was just wondering if you could talk, especially for the students who are sort of in this mode of sort of trying to even figure out what they're doing, <laughs> if you could talk about your own kind of path through those thought processes, if you will, and how that's inflected? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a very personal um, set of experiences for me, and it's one, you know, coming out of who I am, you know, as an African-American male in a predominantly white profession, to mm -hmm. be frank. Um, I started out in landscape architecture, actually, and I went to an all-black all -black school in North Carolina that had the first landscape architecture program in the country which is kind of weird, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, we were like 13. You know, we're the first 13 blacks, you know? Mm -hmm. Graduated in the 80s, so it wasn't that long ago. Um, now the program is almost all white. It's mm -hmm. really interesting. So it really talks about the profession. Yeah, um, yeah. And I just found that landscape architecture for me um, was never about me, right? Um, and it, it hit me over the head when I was in Rome um, in the mid-90s when we were going to all these archaeological sites, I would have these fights with um, Miss mm. Fentress, who was leading the archaeology. We were in North Africa, and they kept talking about the Moors. You know, the Moors, this, the Moors. And I kept saying, who are the Moors? <laughs> oh, they were the Berbers. <laughs> Tell and, me more. And no one wanted to say black. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, they never mm -hmm. mentioned black. And mm -hmm. like, in all of these places, I'm like, these are black places, you know? Mm -hmm. And we go to Toledo. Is there, they're the Moors. I'm like, mm -hmm. this seems like some African stuff going on here. Um, <laughs> and no one really talked about it in the sense that it resonated. Right? And so then I went to architecture school and I found that there was more conversation around culture and race. Del Upton was one of my professors and a good friend um, who got me into Vlach and a lot of people yeah. looking at the cultural arts in, 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 um, in architecture and arts. And he wrote the book on, you know, the, the shotgun house is an African, you know, thing which blew my mind. It was in this little book, you know, and it was like on the library shelf. It was the only thing I could turn to in architecture school. Um, and coming out of that, I then figured out I wanted to practice, you know, a kind of a hybrid practice that was somewhere between urbanism and landscape. And I just started making up projects, mm -hmm. you know, because it's one of those things where, like, there's not a project for you. Let's make one up. And so I started writing down, actually, everything that was happening to me in my neighborhood. And that turned into Urban Diaries, the which is project, a book. Yeah. And that almost became my manifesto mm -hmm. to a certain degree. And, and it was a very simple proposition. It was like, what if I design things based on what was really happening, right? And this is like 1997, Radical, right? right? Yeah, Radical, no, it's, it right? was. And so it's like, uh, yeah, well, true. one day I'm walking home and, you know, someone's having sex out in a car. Wow, there's two, four, four legs hanging out, just going at it, right? <laughs> and there are these kids are walking down the street, and what blew my mind mm. was they were oblivious, right? <laughs> because it's normal. And so I made this thing called the drive through brothel, right? You're like, okay, when the doors are down, someone's in there banging it out, man. When the doors are open, it's okay. And this was a little kind of thing on the street side, but I also designed a house, a home for prostitutes, which was next to the church. And there were these stories that I started mm -hmm. carving together, and I would call like colleagues, particularly women colleagues, to make sure, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do here. Am I doing the right thing? And it just created this mm -hmm. interesting sets of conversation. Mm -hmm. And 
by the time I exhausted some of that work, I then ran into another fantastic woman, Mary Jane Jacobs, who invited me down to Charleston, and this was back in 2005, and we did two installations at Spoleto. Mm -hmm. And then she talked me into going to Chicago to the Art Institute to get a, a degree in um, sculpture, and I did that, I don't know how, commuting from Berkeley. And what that mm -hmm. helped me do was look back over 15 years of work mm -hmm. and say, well, what was I really trying to do? And I was able then to craft my thesis around this idea of a cultural practice, which then gave me a very clear format, which was um, kind of the everyday mundane, wow. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of it just took, you know, the search, me searching. So it had very little to do with others. But, and I think everybody, you know, at a certain point in your life, it's like you're sitting there working and going like, what does this have to do with me? Right, I mean, where's my voice? And I don't know about you guys, I don't want to have that voice that I see every, I don't want to imitate someone else's voice. Mm -hmm. I'm not in it to do the next big, tall thing or the next big, big thing. I'm in it to, <laughs> you know, say something. And, you know, different projects allow you to have different voices. And, you know, we do, you know, we, we do corporate work, and this is the reason why I kind of put the presentation together. I wanted you guys to kind of see that, you know, it's not just a certain kind of work, but it doesn't matter what you do. You can have soul in your work. You can have ideas in your work that resonate. So you could be working for the, the client, you know, that has the multi-million dollar thing, or you're working for a local community. And hopefully, hopefully what you saw there is there's no drop off for us. It's like when I'm working on museums, it's just like I'm working in communities, right? And if I have to subsidize the museums to make that work better, I will subsidize it through the time, and that makes me sleep at night better. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the long answer. And I, I have one that's a great, I have, I have one follow-up question, and then maybe we can open it up, but I just, just to pick up on your, say something, you know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I totally agree. Say something, and I, I do feel like, and I'm glad you saw some of the, the urban design work, because I do feel like there's been this, um, this kind of trend, also say something and also paired with, um, don't come, don't, don't like try to fix it, right? Because I, I do feel like there's this been trend toward kind of data-driven design or like, you know, sometimes we all fall into this trap of like, well, 72% of X does this and therefore Y, right. you know, and that there's some kind of, you know, need uh, of designers, planners, architects, you know, to sort of justify their work along a kind of a trajectory, right. which seems like it's, you know, oops, it seems like it's a, you know, a, a clear path, right? A linear path. Right. But I feel like you have like a very non-linear process and also one that's not necessarily interested in kind of like justifying, but interested in like, especially with this, the freed, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like, what is a new context that I can make? And, you know, I guess I wonder if you could just comment on this kind of, you know, process, I guess, design process and somehow have, you know, how have we gone, <laughs> how are we doing and, and what, what do we need to kind of think about relative to you know, this notion of uh, uh, melding like intuition into a process. Well, I mean, everybody wants metrics today, right? I mean, everybody yeah. wants to know how it's gonna turn out. Um, and as one of my old professors used to say, you just need courage. I mean, and it's really like, it's easier said than done. Yeah. Um, but when I presented Freed in the community, I was scared out of my boots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, every time I present a project, I'm, I'm freaked out that someone's gonna go like, you can't do that, we hate it, you know, but that you have to then defend mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, the metrics are, you know, me presenting it in a compelling way to bring people along. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'd rather do that than sit and map. I'd rather put right. that stuff in the appendix. I want yeah, people yeah, to know yeah. I've done it. Totally agree. Yeah. I don't need to show them how bad off they are, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's like you go in the community, it's like, okay, like 80% uh, of you are un uneducated. <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're poor, <laughs> so you know, but that's the metrics, right? right Versus right. going in and saying, yeah. you know, this is an amazing place. You know, the school used to be amazing or like in my neighborhood now, uh, Bill Russell went to that high school, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's amazing but it's fenced in, you yep. can't use it, you know, but, but Bill Russell went there, you know, <laughs> Kurt Flood went to the other one. If you guys yeah. don't know these guys, these guys are amazing people, right? <laughs> um, but we, we don't tend to want to build those things up 
as ways in to have conversation and we need these other pieces. And I would just say the metrics are good to understand the situation, but you have to remember what you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am not a social scientist. Mm -hmm. I am not a carpenter. You know, I have some skills and I try to figure out before any project what my skill set is. And there's always agency, but at the end of the day, it right. comes back to what I do. And yeah. so I'm not gonna tell someone, it's like, I'm gonna solve all your poverty, I'm gonna, your education, this park is gonna be amazing, right? You come to the park, you're gonna be fully educated. <laughs> right, but that's the idea that people, yeah. oh, this street, if you come to this street, this is a great new street, man, it's gonna like give you $20, you know, an hour. Yeah, right. and it's like, what? But you can talk about it in a different way that, you know, you know, it's like the old, um, you guys probably won't even know this, the old uh, Richard Pryor um, did this great routine where he says, just, some people just want sunshine on their face, right? And he's talking about, you know, workers, people who are in the dark. Sometimes just a little freaking sunshine <laughs> goes a long way. And that's what I mean. If you think in that way that the power of your craft will allow people to just have some sunshine, that might be enough. So. Richard Pryor was this amazing comedian. <laughs> no, anyone? Sure. Anyone? <laughs> okay, let's take a few. Let's take a few questions from the audience. Any questions? I think there's a microphone. I'm not sure. Okay, great. There is a mic. Thanks for talking in the mic. Um, so I actually took your studio at Berkeley like five years ago, and one of my favorite lectures that you gave was you started it with this idea that landscape is architecture is art. And uh, I, I did, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of, of your lecture, so I, but I saw the last project and I remembered that so clearly when you were describing that project. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you utilize that philosophy in teaching design and, and being a, to use a phrase, a multimodal multi designer, someone who's designing from a perspective of art, architecture, yeah. and landscape. How you doing, man? It's good to see you. Pretty good. Yeah. Change your hair. A little stressed out. Didn't recognize you changed you. your hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, Rosalind Cross's um, sculpture in the expanded field. Most mm -hmm. of you probably know it. If you don't, it's a. For me, it was a really watershed moment when I read the piece because it deals more with sculpture out in a. I wouldn't say contextless, but in a non-urban sort of site where. It's easy to go out to a desert and, and dig a hole, right? And, but what she posited was the way they were digging holes were landscape inspired or architecture inspired. And they are non-architecture or non-landscape. And I love that because what it does is it allows you to sort of move back and forth without having to identify. And it comes back to nomenclature. It comes back to what we call things. So if I don't call it a park, mm -hmm. if I don't call it a building, I have this amazing, amazing open, openness to make things. And I'm doing a studio right now, the museum in the city, and I have the students actually walking around the city finding non-architecture and non-landscapes. And it's interesting what they're finding, like underneath a freeway, right? It's non-architecture. And you see that because people use it as architecture, because they see something in it. And in each one of these, you have to have that, that position where someone sees it but it's not defined, and it's actually it stays open. And that's the beautiful thing about sculpture, right? It's, well, good sculpture, it's open, and it allows for multiple interpretations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Question, we have some, some in the front, and was there one in the back? Oh, one down here. I guess my, my question was about, um, the issue of interpretation, and you were already just talking about that now, but maybe you would elaborate a little bit more on, um, specifically on, on signage, and I noticed some projects, like the UVA project, where there was this sort of very mm -hmm. traditional, conventional interpretive sign, and you then had the other project where you talked about those historical mm -hmm. markers and wanting to get beyond that, and I'm just curious about how you have those conversations, if you've ever done a project, say, for the National Park Service, or you know, where they have these kinds of yeah. requirements, and, yeah. and what thoughts you have about navigating that terrain, mm. or, or, <laughs> or in, in, in how that relates to how we tell stories, right. and how we don't define what the story, how one might 
understand yeah. the story from the, the written word versus the other kinds of experiences? Well, of course, I would love for everything to be open <laughs> and non-pedagogical in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, but at the Kitty Foster site, I was blown away that they actually wrote down my conceptual idea <laughs> because yeah, they but put it on the signs, like right, the right. shadow catcher, the shadow <laughs> catcher, which is an interesting thing that you hardly ever see, right? You don't go to the, the uh, memorial, the, the Vietnam memorial, and they tell you exactly what Maya Lin wanted. Oh, she did this black thing that goes down. Da, 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 da. But it would be kind of <laughs> radical if she did, if someone did. And so it made me think about that. It's like, well, does that like kill the power of the piece? Mm. It, I think in a way, it gives you new nomenclature, a, maybe a different way. And if there is, if that nomenclature is something that you want people to reinforce, I think it's okay. Uh, for the freed piece, you know, we talked a lot, the community, because we said, do we want a horizontal or vertical? And that came out of the community. We talked a lot about it. And the community was like, well, I like that you can read it. And then certain people was like, I like that you can't read it. And then people started to see, <laughs> right. oh, it looks like so a steeple. Mm -hmm. You know, there was all of this other reading. And that allowed for that to breathe. I know the last project, RAA is doing the um, interpretation. It's a museum. Uh -huh. right. And I know there's going to be tons of signage. Um, and we haven't negotiated that. But I think, again, as long as there is a kind of reinterpretation of language. I think it's, it's powerful. It's when it, that, that language is mundane and it's the same. Mm, so. mm, mm. Great, oh, there's one in the question in the back. Yeah. Hi, thank you again for your presentation. It was wonderful. Given that so many public spaces lack resources or are underfunded, I was wondering how, to both of you, how do you think public spaces can be valued by developers? Or how can landscape architects have a voice at the table with the architects and the developers, especially to fund or prioritize small anonymous spaces, like small pocket parks or playgrounds um, that don't have the publicity that museums um, or big name projects might have? I think I understand your question. How do we get involved? I mean, one is, but I think you have to be willing to enter in a kind of a diverse set of practices. Um, we've designed things from small community gardens uh, out in Queens uh, with the New York Restoration mm -hmm. right. Garden, which is a nonprofit. Right. Uh, nonprofits do really great work, but I think they need good designers. Um, if you look at a lot of the work that's being done, you know, again, I think. I mean, for me, I like working with a lot of the small local because, again, the talent pool, you know, is far to the right. You know, we don't have our greatest designers making those spaces, and I think that's a big issue. And I think there is a market for talented people to work in between the lines. And I think if you look even at municipalities um, and even developers, you know, that you need to be able to be more agile Again, and trying to understand how to somehow take what they're doing and push it, right? And not push it to the point where they lose money, but like we work for developers who are doing like, we're doing a plaza in a downtown in Oakland. And unbeknownst to them, we're thinking about the homeless who are two blocks away, mm -hmm. right? And we're taking that project on because we know they have to leave their plazas open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, And so it's not about recreating maybe new public space, but it might even be leveraging those spaces that are already on board or those spaces that are being built. I, for one, am not a big component of small, little, unused pocket parks and things like that. I think we've gone through that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, to me now, I think the, the job is to get people to see landscape. You know, I think we're at a point now where, when I say landscape, and I started out talking about this, Manhattan is an island. You know, if you live on a coastal plain, if you live in an estuary, mm -hmm. that's more important to me than making a little postage stamp and putting a tot lot there. Mm -hmm. And it's not about, you know, just resiliency, but it's about getting people to kind of understand that there are places that you can actually go in these landscapes that are pretty amazing. But if you don't think about them in that sense, you lose all awareness mm -hmm. of, of the power of those landscapes. So. Almost like a bioregional yeah. kind of presence. Well, it's like your projects, again, mm -hmm. the Hudson River. It's mm -hmm. like, I kept thinking in the presentations, 
what's the deal? The river was always over there on the right, on the mm -hmm, left. Mm -hmm. You know, that river should be in the middle. I mean, I mean I'm just saying, <laughs> it's, it's a really river. True. And and it's like this amazing thing. I, I was thinking about the Hudson River painters, the sublime, all mm -hmm. of this stuff. But instead we're like looking at these little communities in vacancy. But if yep. we looked at the river, the regional if we context. looked at because you're looking at regional patterns, but if you like right. said, wow. It's not about Poughkeepsie. Right? Mm -hmm. It's about this larger thing. And maybe people in Poughkeepsie might be able to see it, mm -hmm. and it gives them something else. So. Yeah, that's really true. Maybe we'll take a last question or one or two here. Sorry, go ahead. You have the mic. <laughs> go for it. Hi, thank you. Um, I really loved your work, and um, I was curious about some of the parks where uh, you had kind of like daytime, nighttime scenes. And I like the, how you, you know, really see everything from you take all the different angles. You don't just, you know, use the common frame. Um, and in terms of parks, I don't know, like I'm working on a studio project where there's kind of like a, a park and, you know, nighttime occupation. <clears throat> I was just wondering if you could speak to, like, your ideas around uh, using the lighting to create a certain effect uh, in the parks at night, and does it actually provide safety, or as an important, um, do you design to, like, a different person almost at nighttime versus daytime? Yep. That's a really good question, and it's one that we don't do very well. You know, most projects, you can't afford a lighting designer. Lighting is hard. <laughs> lighting is really, really hard. Uh, I mean, in a lot of our early projects, it's just, the, the lighting is just wrong. Um, but you need a lighting designer, and you talk with the lighting designer and you, to tell them what, you, what you're trying to do. And it's a conversation between the two. And I like the way you put it. It is a different, it's a different way of understanding landscape, different than buildings. Uh, when you move around in the landscape, what happens is things collapse. The horizon collapse. And so you're just only looking here. You can't see that anymore. So this becomes really, really important. And we try to then highlight that for you because that's the detail that you might not see in the daytime. It's also one of these things where, um, you know, the way people think is like the director of the museum was like, when I went to present, he's like, Walter, nighttime, you think people are going to be sleeping in those baskets? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> could be. Right? You know, could be, you know, but, but they're lit, right? right? right and I said, right. and if you don't, you know, we can pump up the light when someone comes in. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, a, it's something that if you think about it as a designer, you can control it because if you don't, someone else will control it and mm -hmm. you'll get daylight, right? Uh, I also think, you know, to think about landscapes in the rain, I try to get my students to draw yeah. when they're drawing. It's like, what does it look like when it's raining? What does it look like, you know, late at night? What does it look like when you're sitting down, right? What does it look like when you're laying down? It changes. And the more you can kind of put yourself in different positions, I think the more fodder you have for making decisions. Hi, thanks very much for this. Um, at, at a different scale, <clears throat> landscape has become associated with all sorts of other things, ecology, landscape urbanism, landscape this, that, and it's been kind of appropriated by many other disciplines in, in lots of different ways. <clears throat> How do you feel about that? <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. Uh, it's not an issue for me. Uh, I understand those who who take the professional stance that, you know, it should only stay here. Um, what, 30, 40 years ago, these colleges were created, right? Like I teach in the College of Environmental Design, where they brought in landscape planning, architecture, because they believed in um, multidisciplinary design, right? These places have become <laughs> um, a thiefdom, you know, of, <laughs> Still separate, but let's take a little bit of that, exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think the more that architects like landscape, I think it's the possibility for landscape architects to have better conversations with architects and vice versa. And I do think that there should, I think there should be more agency in landscape and other fields so that there becomes, there's a place to have dialogue versus, oh, that architect stole my project. Right, versus, you know, I teach my students, you know, in first year, Kate took one of my studios. Architecture was like, here's a building, do something, and figure out how to make that section, figure out how to draw and understand this culture, because this is the place, right, where we're having the conversation. And some shy away, and I think the good ones, you know, take it on, but I think you have to take it on. 
And I think the more, again, the more people see landscape, the better the conversation becomes. Because I do think good architects, if they understand landscape, they, they, they are better architects. Right? And not just in a kind of pastiche way, but in a way that's really thorough. So. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. It will not be forever until we have you back at Columbia. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. <laughs>